what's what's going on right now is is the the revenue and the block rewards in the Bitcoin network are falling every four years. So by the year 2035, 99 percent of the Bitcoin's been mined, and that means that the network starts to run only on transaction fees. The incentive of the network to burn energy will fall almost by an order of magnitude and the efficiency of the SHA-256 ASICs will increase by an order of magnitude. So what, what you've got is a network that is decentralizing itself and making itself exponentially more efficient. So you could reasonably expect, if we look 20 years out, that probably the cost to secure $100 trillion, well, it might be $50 billion, but that would be five basis points five basis points of the total value on the network, which makes it the least energy intensive, most efficient technology that we have perhaps discovered ever in the history of the human race. All right, a very compelling argument there, Michael. So you're not concerned about this narrative of it not being clean and green and the whole energy consumption aspect. You've ruled that out. You're ruling out the idea that uh, governments and central banks are going to intervene and regulate it in some way that severely impacts it and undermines its uh, flourishing. So what is your outlook for Bitcoin then? Because earlier you told me that you don't see any existential threats to it. So where do you see it going? I think Bitcoin is, is um Again, the dominant digital monetary network. And uh, that means that you can expect first thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of corporations to plug into it. And we should have 250 million people that hold Bitcoin by the end of the year. So I expect a billion people within five years and I expect 5 billion people uh, within a decade or so. I think that there'll be 5 billion people or more with mobile wallets, with uh, digital currency and digital assets. And Bitcoin will become the, uh, the global settlement and settlement network and the global synchronization network for all of them. Um, what, what Bitcoin does is it allows you to establish a trusted relationship with a counterparty. And that means, you know, there's a, there's a phrase, you know, the secret to a successful relationship is shared values. And that's the truth with two people, and it's the truth with two companies or two countries. So shared values requires a value network. And so Bitcoin is a shared value network. And I can say, for example, that in 20 years of trying, there's no way that my company could do business in Nigeria. There's no company, there's no way that a bank in the US can trade easily with a bank in Nigeria or Lebanon or Iraq or between Nigeria or Zimbabwe and Argentina because of the difficulty of establishing trust in, in the fiat monetary system. So when you establish a digital monetary system, you can establish trust of value in 24 hours and so what I what I think will happen is I think we're going to see an explosion of billions of people doing tens of billions of transactions on layer twos applications that are all synchronized with the protocol of Bitcoin as the layer one. And I think Bitcoin will just continue to grow as an asset class. It'll be the underlying asset that's used to establish trust across all of these counterparties everywhere in the world in the 21st century. So what does that mean for the price of Bitcoin? What is your projection there? Over time, it will go up. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I got that. How high? Right. Care to give me some kind of number? Yeah. I, I think that if, if you look at the $500 trillion monetary planet and the $1 trillion, you know, crypto asset fire burning in the core, you can expect that that will continue to expand. It's been expanding pretty rapidly. I think it'll continue to expand as it absorbs the monetary energy of the other store of value assets. So it should slurp all of the energy out of, or large portions of the energy out of the precious metals and then out of uh, monetary indexes and, uh, and broad money equity ETFs. And so there's no reason why it shouldn't go from a trillion to 10 trillion to 100 trillion. Uh, over what time frame? I, well, I'm not a trader, so I don't guess by the week, by the month, even by the quarter. 
I mean, for me, a decade is a target. And I'm expecting that this thing will just continue to grow for ever for my lifetime. I don't see any reason why it won't stop growing because it's for the first time in the human race's history and first time in 5,000 years, we figured out how to create digital scarcity on an open network. That's, that's a one-time invention. And the protocol itself is like as profound as English or Arabic numerals. It's like once, once you've got a way to do arithmetic with Arabic numerals, how long will that go? Well, long time, 400 years so far, I guess, in the Western world has been going. So I, I don't know why this won't just continue to grow for hundreds and hundreds of years as a protocol. You mentioned ETFs and you mentioned scarcity. And there we could be seeing Bitcoin's ETFs approved in the US. And there is some argument that with the Bitcoin ETFs, you'll have more Bitcoin derivatives, a bigger Bitcoin's futures market, and that that could ultimately create paper Bitcoin, which could take away from the scarcity of the Bitcoin market. Do you see that happening? I mean, what is your outlook on the impact of potential Bitcoin ETFs and Bitcoin derivatives being approved? I think it's natural that that you're going to see uh, Bitcoin is the solution to everybody's problem. Uh, the big tech companies need an open monetary network uh, to, to build the next generation of products. So like Square Cash, PayPal, eventually Apple, Google, Facebook, they have to build Bitcoin into their mobile wallets because they need this, uh, this universal digital asset on, an, on a protocol, on a global network. Um, all the finance companies, the insurance companies, the fund companies, et cetera, they need to build Bitcoin into their finance products. So if you have a savings account without Bitcoin in it, right, the Bitcoin savings account yields 160% a year for a decade and, and uh, the other conventional bank savings accounts yield 15 basis points. So it's pretty clear that if you don't have a savings account with Bitcoin built into it, all the assets are going to flow out of your bank. If you're Fidelity or Pemco and you have mutual funds, you're going to build Bitcoin into your funds. The ETF is the plain vanilla. So Fidelity's fi filed for a Bitcoin ETF as they have like eight other entities. But, you know, why wouldn't you build Bitcoin into your bond fund? If you look at the performance of bond funds, they're hideous um, over the last decade and especially over the past year. Um, the real, if you look at all treasury funds, all treasury applications, if you have a monetary inflation rate of 15% to 20% a year, and we have that right now, 